Can y'all hear me now? Okay, hey, uh, can y'all welcome my amazing, beautiful bride, Jill Sage. We are so excited to be up here today, and we're going to talk, we're going to keep it real, we're going to go for it today. Before that, though, I, I just wanted to do, and I'll let you kind of, we, it's, you're choking? Okay, do we need to call a medic? I will do CPR right now on this stage in front of everybody. Um, as she drinks some water and does not choke, can you guys help me welcome, we have some alumni in the, in the room today. We have Christian and Savannah right over here. We all wave. And then right next to them, Aaron and Ethan, and we just want to welcome, and baby Elijah here today. So can y'all welcome our, the alumni that are in the room? We love, love you guys. So proud of, of, of all of you guys, all five of you guys, and, and just what God's doing through, through your life. And so we're going to talk today about dating, and I have a great, if you want to write down, anybody taking notes? You good? <laughs> I'm just getting This is what happens at our house. She's always moving furniture around, reshuffling everything, and because um, and she knows better. So hey, so if you want to write a title down, y'all ready for a really profound title? This is a talk on dating. Can yeah. I get an amen? All right. Okay, so we are in a series called Keep It Real. And this was a topic, obviously, because of y'all's age, um, that y'all have a lot of questions about. And um, we're excited um, to, we're going to share a little bit of our story, um, tell you where we failed, some, some lies that we believed, but then also tell you lessons that we learned, some truths that we found, and hopefully that it will help you today. We're so excited. We're so proud of y'all. Uh, we love you guys. We never want to get up here without telling you how much we just talk about you guys in our family, pray for you. And so we're really excited to be with y'all today. Yeah, because this, this is a really big topic. Obviously, it's something you think about, and, and it's something that's on your mind. Who, who all thinks about this anybody, topic? Just be honest. Anybody care about marriage one day? All right. <laughs> Those of you who didn't raise your you, hand, you guys know you that <laughs> uh, there was a season of Highlands College history, and it was, it was many, many years ago where we didn't allow dating in Highlands College. Who, who thanks God we got set free of that right there? Anybody? All right. So, because here, here's kind of always been Jill and I's philosophy is is that we want to we want to go right at it. Number one, you're in a season in your life where that's already naturally on your mind, and actually we'll talk about this a little bit. It's such an important part of your ministry journey, and and you know what we're okay with? We're okay with figuring it out together. And if, and if we're gonna if we're gonna go through bumps in the road or even pain or even failure in this area, I would rather it be together as a family so we can walk through it than send you out one day and say, hope you figure it out. Because uh, it's just a, such a big part of, of your life. And so we got a lot of questions over the years. And this is not even, um, some of these are actually from HC students and some from other college students within church life and just through over, over the years. And I've just collected some of them that have come my way. And so maybe some of these tie into what you're thinking uh, today. So there's just so many, when we talk about this topic, it's big. That's, that's the big idea here. And there's so many different kinds of questions. And I don't think we can hit all of them. And we're not the experts, by the way. We have not done everything perfect. But we have an amazing marriage that God has blessed. And this is my best friend. Yeah. And we're Truly. having, a, we're having, oh, that's a, the first of all, that's great. Um, and then, but we're having so much fun on the adventure of life together. And that is our heart for you guys. That who, the person you end up with, that you have that same kind of unity and spirit. So just some questions, you know, how do I, how do I find clarity from God on who is the best person for me? We're actually going to talk about that later on uh, today. You know, how do you know when you're healthy enough spiritually and emotionally to be in a relationship? Uh, is it a, this is a funny one. Is it okay for a girl to show her interest in the guy first? It's a great question. Uh, how, and this is, I kind of hit this on Sunday, but we, we'll talk about this a little bit too today. Just, you know, what, how do we talk about purity? If, 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 especially, and this was the question here, especially if I feel like I've already lost that in my life. You know, now I'm in a new relationship. How do we have that discussion about uh, where we've, we both have a past or maybe one of us does? Uh, is there only one person God has for you and have I missed it? So that's, that's a great, that's, like, that's a fear-based question. Like, oh my gosh. Um, you know, who, who should be my ma main people to go to for advice while dating? And absolutely, any reality show or social media platform is actually the best advice. I'm just totally Th This out. next one is my favorite question. So, um, you know, what is, this is actually an actual question. What is flirting? How do, I, how do I know when it's happening? Come on. If you're asking that question, you know what it is. And then, <laughs> what is flirting? How do I know when it's happening? <laughs> Definitely anonymous questions, right? And then how far is too far before marriage? Hello? That's the question that we have talked about. So I think that, I don't know if those are any of your specific questions, but I know you have questions. And I know you're thinking about it. And it was in the middle of that when, when someone asked, you know, where do we go to for advice? If, if, if again, we're not an expert and we're going to pull some from God's word and just from a lot of great examples. But the bottom line is if, in, if you catch nothing else today is to make a decision, I'm going to look to godly counsel 
when it relates to this area. And that may not be your parents or may not be a, a, you know, a relationship you grew up around. But in this season, we're going to seek out God's truth and examples of, that have lived out that truth. And if we do that, that will be a true north for the rest of your life. Yeah. So. Because it's okay to ask questions. This is a very important area, and I think this is why we're so passionate about it. Because in uh, we're, we're going to be married 17 years this year. That's amazing. Feel, we feel so much like adults these years. Like we have kids and a mortgage, and 17 years sounds We've like We've had a lot. kids for a while. Yeah, I know. But it's just, yeah. We have a Costco <laughs> membership. And we live there. Yeah, we do live there. <laughs> um, but it's okay to have questions. This is an important area to have questions about because outside of getting saved, this is the number one Absolutely. most important decision you will make. Any in married your couples journey. in the room give an amen to that? Yeah. This is this is it. So so I want you to feel y'all look at it. I want y'all to feel weight right now. I think there's such a casual atmosphere around the world, and Jill's gonna read a scripture that so hits this right on the head. I, I want us to feel in a, in a godly, not, not a pressure or not like a, a breaking weight, but a, a holy weight when it comes to this. It's a really big deal. And honestly, if, we, if you've got everything else in Highlands College, but you miss this, then, it, then your ministry is going to be affected by that for the rest of your life. So. And, and we know so many people um, that we've seen come in and come out um, in ministry, and it is because of who they marry. So who you marry can either propel you or it can hinder you in your ministry calling. And so it's a big decision. And, and that's what we want you all to feel the weight. And we want those questions to be answered. But today we're really hoping that um, we don't just answer your questions, that we give you a new perspective. Because God's ways are higher than our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? And even around dating, he has a perspective that he's like, I hear those questions, but see it from my perspective, and it's worth it. The reason why it's worth it is because it's more than we could ever ask, dream, or imagine on the other side of just surrendering and submitting to his way and doing it his way. And so uh, I know you all have all heard this verse before, but Romans 12, 2 in the message paraphrase, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. And guys, I think our culture is pretty vocal about dating. What's okay? What's acceptable? And so that's where we get the question, how close to the line can we get? No, God is like, there is no line. I want you running my way, not towards culture's way. So our prayer today that is instead that we fix our attention on God and that we'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from us and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around us, always dragging us down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of us, develops well-formed maturity in us. So this is, I'm going to pray for us, and, and we're going to go for it. We're going to tell some stories about our life, and we're going to keep it real, all right? But I want you to just have this visual today, all right? This, this scripture says we don't have to be conformed, which conforming is a process. It's a journey. Transform can happen in a moment. So maybe your entire life, you think about, and, and I wish I could draw this out. If you think about like a, a, a meter, maybe you've been the needle on this side that for so long you've been trying to do this God's way. You've been trying to actually, because of the world around us has impacted us so much, we've, been, we've started at their point, and we've been trying to grow to God, and it's been really hard, and every time we get close, we feel like we get slapped back down, and we make a mistake, or we miss it, or we have a wrong perspective. What we're believing is going to happen today is that we are transformed. Can I get an amen? And that we're on the other side. And now we just take on, we take on immediately, and it says readily respond to it. We just take on God's perspective when it comes to this. And anytime we try to get back close to the line, God is pulling us right back to his perspective. Yeah. And we're believing that can happen in our hearts today. It's a new mindset, a new heart around this area, and that God can use this again to propel your ministry, which is what this entire place is about. This is a catalyst for you into the calling God has on your life. So let's pray for each other. If you're next to your boyfriend or girlfriend, grab their hands because it might get weird after this, all right? So I'm just kidding. Or oh, not kidding. If you're right. married, you can grab your yeah. spouse's hands. So, um, <laughs> Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your presence, for your power and your goodness. And, God, I just pray that there would be no distractions in the next few moments. That we would have a lot of fun together. But more than anything else, there would be hope and joy and peace and a perspective that really just, as your word says in, in Romans 12, too, it, we just want to fix our attention, put our eyes on you. 
And, and what, when we see you and your ways, then it shows us any area of our life that's out of order, that needs to be transformed. And we just humbly put those into your hands today. We take our hands off. We're not writing our own story. You're writing it. And we trust you with the pen. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Okay, so I want to share with you guys a little bit of my story. I grew up in West Texas. Where are all my Texas people at? Loud and proud. I hear you. Um, we have better barbecue in Alabama than Texas. Not we'll true at all. He knows it's not true. You love my dad's His, brisket. Everything's bigger in Texas, but I always tell Jill, but you live in Alabama. You left. So we win. Because Jesus called me here, but Texas is still in my heart. Um, <laughs> if Texas ever secedes, we're going back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Okay, that's a joke. You're getting me distracted. Okay, my story. Okay, so I grew up, just to give you context of the family that I grew up in, I grew up in a great home. Um, my mom, I grew up Lutheran. It's a real dynamic, spirit-filled, charismatic uh, <laughs> denomination. Keep it Very. Very loud. <laughs> um, and, and my mom was so, she is such a servant. She's on staff here. Um, Donna Kanotic is my mom. Yes, she's amazing, um, but she was so devoted, um, and my dad, um, who is very involved in Church of the Highlands now and making, I mean, it just amazes me of what he um, is involved in and the impact that he has now, but when I was growing up, he didn't really go to church much, and I grew up with two older brothers, so I was the baby and I was the girl. I was brat. I was brat. It's Okay. I got set free from that. The Lord worked in me. Um, but all growing up, uh, I was fiercely independent. And I'm not celebrating that. That's just what I was. Um, I was fiercely independent, and um, I enjoyed being in control. <laughs> I enjoyed being in charge. And I just thought that there was nothing in the world that I couldn't do, which there's some good to that, and there's some negative to that. And as far as it comes to relationships, um, I started, I had a boyfriend at a young age. I can't remember. It was elementary school. Um, and honestly, it was, I liked, his name was Blake. And I, we got along really well because we raced each other on the playground. And of course, I won. So I was like, this relationship was meant to be. <laughs> You can see how distorted my view was. Um, and uh, growing up, I just um, always loved, still to this day, I don't need a lot of friends. I need some close friends that know a lot about me. Um, but I, and I was always more comfortable growing up with guys because I had brothers. And so I was very comfortable with guy friends and that I would um, let them cross that boundary of friend relationships, um, friends with benefits, whatever. Um, and I would just, I thought that I had to, to get intimacy, I had to be physical. And I just looked for so much value. Even though I came from a great home, I looked for value in my relationships with guys. I crossed boundaries that I wish I never would have crossed. Um, and I'm sharing this because I know some of you might be in this room today. And there's hope. And there's a different story that God wants to write through you. And um, I found myself in a really bad place my senior year in high school. I got in a lot of trouble. On December 13th, um, I grew up in Texas, so we had a zero tolerance policy, even at the school. And we had an open campus lunch where at, camp, at lunchtime, everybody left for an hour and came back to class, which is, I, how is that ever a good idea? Um, so a bunch of my friends and I went over to somebody's house because we would save our money to go party on the weekends and eat at our parents at somebody's house so we would not have to buy, eat out. Um, and that day we all drank at lunch. And um, we got caught. One of the girls had been taking shots all day, and so she threw up in class, obviously very inebriated. And when she got called to the principal's office, she ratted us all out, gave them all of our names. And that day was when rock bottom hit for me. And my 
I mean, I got a minor in consumption ticket. I got my driver's license taken away. I wasn't allowed, I wasn't going to be allowed to graduate anymore. It's my senior year. I couldn't go to senior prom. I got kicked off the basketball team. I got kicked off the soccer team. I got sentenced to alternative education program, which was an off-site facility where I uh, spent my hours in a cubicle. Teacher sent me um, my work. I was not allowed on school property. From this experience, um, I dealt with depression. I got diagnosed with severe depression. My, I did not get out of bed for days. I remember my dad coming and picking me up and saying, you have to go with me to the store. You have to go with me here. I was in a bad place. And from that, I was searching. All I could say was in my relationships, in my life, I thought, my gosh, there has to be more to life than what I'm living right now. So I got um, recruited for soccer because I could play club soccer. It was not school affiliated. And I got um, recruited by University of Alabama, Birmingham, which is a college here in town. And um, I came for an official visit. And I had no idea then, but God was drawing me here. I felt such peace. I didn't know how to say that back then, but now I do know that it was peace. And in my first semester, or was it first semester? Second semester, I was still searching. I was like, God, and that's when Church of the Highlands was planted. And there was a group of us athletes, and you were one of them. Athletes, you heard it here. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, just how to change my life. I was like, how do I change my life? How do I change my life? And from that moment on, I was looking for something different. I was so ready. God was like, give up this, give up this. And I was like, done, 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 done. Because I was so desperate for something to change in my life. And um, in that group of athletes, I met you. And we hung out as friends a lot. And um, I was interested in what would come next. It was like... The way she's described it for it was like a light in a dark room. It's been through a really bad season, and all of a sudden, music played, and you walked in, and it was like it wasn't actually like that. But um, so my story's a little a little different, and just for time, I'll, I'll just carve it down. I grew up Methodist Baptist. Anybody like that? Methodist Church Baptist Youth Group was for me, and so um, grew up very again incredible family, uh, very blessed. My dad is my hero, my mom, very close siblings. Um, but for whatever reason, the enemy, and I, don't, I cannot find out the reason why, and I think that's maybe part of the story, but there was a deep fear within my, my I always struggled with fear growing up in, a, in really atypical ways. Of like, in this, the only thing I think of, I had a friend who lost his parents at a young age in a car wreck, I, but I always had this image like that, I, that anyone close to me was going to die, like a car wreck or a situation. If, they, if my parents would leave town, I would think, oh my gosh, I would be, have so much anxiety and fear with that. And I think all of that fear kind of pushed me in a little bit of, like, even social isolation where I was, I had great friendships around, but never really kind of felt I had my place. I shared some of that on, on Sunday, even with identity. And for me, relationship-wise, um, you know, having a girlfriend became a way to, on like, on the normal ways of just, like, you're going through middle school and you want to have, you know, status or whatever by having a girlfriend or, bo you know, in your case, boyfriend. For me, it was like, I got to have that, but also just, I just, I felt like this um, security of relationships around me. I wanted, you know, to get people close. So bottom line is from the time I was like 13, 14, all the way through uh, early in college, I always had a girlfriend, but it wasn't because necessarily I didn't want a girlfriend. I felt like I needed it to be complete as a person for a lot of different reasons. And I shared this on Sunday as well. So Sexually, I, 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 we, when we got married, I was a virgin only because of that. Y'all, Blake Lindsay, who preached on Tuesday, by the way, um, for you guys, I heard it was amazing. I was, I was not here. I mean, he literally saved my life when it, as it relates to that because I had never heard a purity message. He preached that message. Um, but so, so I didn't cross those borders, but for, for as far as soul ties, and especially with one girl specifically, we dated for three years, there was just so much emotional connection there. And so when I got to college and really got um, serious about my relationship with Jesus, um, you guys know the, the guy who uh, prepares all the food for Harvest, Thomas Cox. Y'all have met, Tom, many of y'all have met Thomas. That was my college roommates. I played football athlete at UAB. Thomas was a quarterback. We were roommates together. And, um, and Thomas, we are still to this day accountability partners, and he is, he is a friend that I know would take a bullet for me. There's nothing that I wouldn't do for him, he wouldn't do for me. It's, it's just that kind of relationship. And we, we both were in a kind of tough place relationally, had made some mistakes dating, and just decided we were going to go hard after God. And so I just quit dating completely for a year. 
And that, I, just, I only share that part of the story because I just had to, cle- I, there was something broken in the way I was viewing relationships, and I couldn't figure it out by just bouncing to the next girl. Like, I had to have a reset, and it was an entire, and I didn't put a year time frame on it, but it ended up being about a year. And that's when, in the end of that season, um, when um, I was at, we were actually at my house, Jill had come over with some friends, and it was, it was awkward because she wouldn't take her eyes off of me. And um, I'm like, girl, I'm trying to pursue Jesus. Give me space right here. And she's like, well, I'm here to pursue you. And it's just, anyway. Um, <laughs> so both of us in different ways, some brokenness, both of us in different ways, a warped perspective. And there's some lies. And let's hit these. And Jill, you go first. Hit these. I would love you to maybe even write these down for you and maybe even for ministry later on to summarize our single life. I wish we had more time for all of this, but just the, the, give them the four lies that you really believe. Okay, and we know that these may be lies that you believe, but we hope that you figure out the lies that you do believe um, through this. Um, is uh, One of the lies that I believed was that submission meant that I couldn't be strong. Another one um, that really got me was what is on the outside is because it was what got the most attention, my figure, um, was more important than what was on the inside. And then I also believe that, um, which I talked about a little bit, um, is just that I, to get to intimacy, I had to give physically. To feel that connection, I had to give up some of my standard. Um, and then I really believe this one is I could fix him. Yep, I know, I know. Or we like to say, oh, but he has such potential. It's not our job. Yeah. Man, those are like hammers. It's, it's they real. were in my life. <laughs> for me, these are some lies I believe. Guys, I love you all right there for everybody. But just this, these are real. You know, for me, I can share this as well. Like dating was a necessity. And so a hungry, write this down, a hungry need is a dangerous need. So if it's instinct-driven ever in any area of our life, it should be a warning sign, like, warning, warning, this is dangerous. So if I have to have a, if, if any, at any level, a relationship is a, is a, it's being driven by need, like, I have to for X reason, whatever that might be, that should automatically be a warning sign. And so for me, that was, that was the warning sign on the dash constantly. There, quit, quit looking for the fix in another person, and I read this quote on Sunday, too, but if you're ever trying to, to, to find your own identity through intimacy with another person, they'll only become a, you know, you'll be using them to try to complete yourself, and only God can complete you. And so that was a huge deal. Secondly, uh, if I want it, I should get it. And now, I didn't cross the, the line sexually, but for me, and this is kind of a, a warped perspective, there was no line. If I wanted to date a girl, I was going to go after her, whether she was dating somebody else, whether there was anything in the way, I was going to pursue that. For some of you guys, that may be at a physical level, like if I want it, I should have it. That's just real. I think biologically, guys are wired oftentimes with a conquest mindset, and that can translate into relationships and will violate what we believe, will violate, you know, what we, we um, have, have really commis- committed to God or even through, you know, in our faith grown, and we'll see ourselves grow strong and maybe violate some of the things that we feel like God has set us free from, being driven by that just kind of, um, if I want it, I should get it. And then, and then thirdly, it's just this is all going to work out in the end. And this, this is actually a great transition to kind of where we went because for me, I didn't really take this thing seriously because I thought it, I'll, it, at some point, no matter how many times I mess up, I mean, I dated probably seven or eight people seriously in my journey. In the end, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out the right one. I'll figure out how to do this. It'll just come to me. And it wasn't, there wasn't an intentionality behind it. It was just like, I'm just going to find my way through this dark room. And at the other end, it'll, surely it'll all work out. And there's just a whole lot better way than that. And, and any of these lies you believe or any other lie you believe, these are all traps of the enemy He's trying to, again, this is the world's perspective that God wants to set us free from. And so when we got, when we met each other, it was uniquely at a different season how we got there, but we were both in a season where it was like, okay, we want to do this differently. And that's the fertile ground, by the way, for any healthy relationship in Highlands College or any other environment that you'll meet somebody, is that we were, we were both to a place where God was number one, and we were ready to do it his way. And that we would, would uniquely had come to that place, and I think that was, that was the turning point. So we actually met each other at, at a party one night. It was not love a at first. Party. A holy it, party. A holy party. A holy party. It was. <laughs> it was not love at first sight. Um, for her, I do have to be honest. It was for me. I was very interested that night. She would not pay me any attention, and so it took a little bit. And there's a long story there. 
um, of eventually I got her attention, and um, we became best friends over about three or four months, and then, long story short, um, I set up the perfect date to finally win her over. Y'all want to hear a little bit about that? So it was May 13th, 2001. That's our real anniversary in my mind. It's not the day we got married. It's the day of our first kiss. So we met in January. We were friends and around each other, but I, I could never quite, y'all, this is such a great attribute because you were loving Jesus. I could never quite figure out, like, do I have a chance? Y'all know what I'm talking about, guys, when you're like, I just can't read this girl. I was scared to death. So I've set up the perfect day. She couldn't go home for, it was Mother's Day. She couldn't go home to see her mom. She was missing her mom. So I said, why don't we go to my. Because I was 16 hours away from home. Why don't we go to my parents' house? We'll go to church together. And then we, I grew up on a lake. Our, our house is actually a lake house. I was like, we'll go, we'll go to the lake. We'll get on the boat. We'll do a little skiing. She loved horses. We'll end up at a horseback ride at sunset. And then we'll go watch a movie together. Y'all, come on, guys. That's, that's good. I mean, girl, that's, that's the girl. That's, just... that's, good. that's good. And it worked perfectly. We're watching the movie, and I'm, I'm scared to death because I still don't know. And I'm debating, you, know you know that conversation in your head, like, is this, is this, is this, is this, I don't know. It, I'm either about to be really embarrassed or this is my greatest moment. And in the middle of that, Jill leans over to me, true story. She leans over to me, and she looks at me, and she goes, well, are you going to kiss me or what? So now I'm in a different situation of like, do I act like I got it all together and I'm like, whatever, or I'll just, do I just take the embarrassment and be like, actually, yes. And so that's the night, our first kiss. We dated for two years in college yeah, still. Yeah, it was about two and a half. Uh, loving Jesus and, and um, two and a half. Wonderful years. And <laughs> No, they were good. And by any, by any measure of anything going on around us, it was a good relationship. But there was still an unsettling in my heart. For, for me, the independence thing was still deeply in her. Seriously. And, and specifically, y'all are going to love this. Specifically, she was like, I'm not called to be a pastor's wife. So either you give it up <laughs> or I'm gone. She didn't say those words, but that was. I didn't say those but that, words. That, it's true or not true? But I was, well, you he got called at 17 to be a youth pastor. And I. Um, struggled with submission. I believed lies about submission. And therefore, I, every picture that I had seen in a pastor's wife, I knew that I could not do that. And therefore, She's I like, was God's like, God's got to call my life. I, I can't serve you tea the rest of your life and follow you around and hold I your Bible. Couldn't. You know, that was her mind, what that looked like. And I was like, well, if you can't hold my tea and serve me, I mean, my Bible, like, <laughs> not at all. I was trying, we were trying to figure out, okay, unity was not there. There was like a, and it was really, we'll come to this, it was about God's timing yeah. was what was that. We didn't understand what was happening yeah. and some maturity that still had to happen if this was going to be real. So we, we broke up for an entire year, didn't speak to each other, broke up. And she started dating a major league baseball player or whatever. And I, I, on the other hand, was a church janitor during that year. So praise God. But... And here's the best part. I would just hear all my friends talk about, yeah, Jill's dating this guy. He plays for the Texas Rangers. And I'm like, I'm cleaning toilets. Awesome. I'm the worst person on earth. But. but I, out of nowhere. <laughs> we got a cruise. Out of nowhere. This hope. is such a great story. Though. <laughs> out of nowhere. I'm like, I still love this girl. But it's over. And, and you dated somebody else, too, that was completely Slavery. opposite of me. I did not date her. Yeah, so let me take over the story here, okay? <laughs> Baseball player. Okay, so this is my senior year of college. He's uh, got a job now as a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I clean toilets for Jesus. It's best. That was my Highlands College, by the way. Okay, so this I'm one's in, better. I was I, like, that was when I, that was when I was actually being trained for ministry. Can you clean a toilet? Well, okay, then you can go to the next phase of ministry. Right? It's true. It so. is true. Um, so this was um, around Christmas break of my senior year in college, and soccer season is over. My last soccer season is over, and I am doing my last exam, and I am deeply missing Mark. 
and I'm like thinking about him all the time, and I just the the baseball player is done, um, uh, been done for a minute. And like, I don't want that baseball player, <laughs> church janitor. Ooh, that's what I'm looking for. No, honestly, uh, this is important because, you know, I thought that the baseball player fit my list of what I thought God wanted me to marry. Okay, so guys and girls, if you have a list, I need you to hold it real loosely because God knows you better than you know yourself. And praise God I didn't marry that baseball player. Okay, um, he knows way more of where we're headed than we do. So um, I started missing Mark, and I just couldn't handle it. I didn't want to act on it, um, and I just drove home. And I was never good at expressing my feelings because I could just, you know, make it on my own, fiercely independent still, okay? And at Christmas time, I just wrote Mark a really, I mean, pages of, of notes. We didn't, you know, that's what we did back then is we wrote to people um, on paper. And I wrote him a note about everything, apologized for things. I'm sorry I never opened up. I'm sorry for this. I've changed in this. This is what God has done in me here. Like, this is the journey that I've been on over the past year. And my mom sat me down, Donna, Donna Canotic. She'll sit you down, too. Some of you all have her as a navigator, you know. And she just said, Jill, you can't do this. You can't send this note to him expecting just to get him back in your life unless you're really real, unless you're willing to commit to marriage, you can't send that letter. And so I held on for it, to it for a long time, um, weeks, and I finally sent it to him. And I thought, oh, he's going to drive out to Texas, and he is going to, like, rescue me. He's going to be like, I've been missing you. Let's get married tomorrow. And um, I didn't ever hear from him. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Stone cold. Are we, we sending me a letter after all of that? <laughs> Call me on the phone, girl. Come to my house. Okay, I know we got to keep going. We've got to yeah, move. We got to. We're gonna go late. We're gonna. Okay, go late. so we get to this place, and I <laughs> we're we're back. In, I'm back at college. I'm now as an assistant coach. I'm finishing out my degree. And we saw each other at a Disciple Now. We were leading a dis D Now. I love D Nows. Okay. If you don't know so, what that is, it's just yeah, find so I'll, out. Yeah, so I was tagging. So the, when I got, tr tr all jokes aside, when I got the letter, it freaked me out. And this, I need you guys to hear, like, I, the same holiness that she had felt that her mom had said that when you send this. I get this letter, and I'm like, if I open this door back up, I, 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 had, I actually had not healed from it, but I had just hidden it away, right? Y'all been there before? Like, that, it hurt that bad. I'm, I'm finally not thinking about it all the time. And so I'm like, okay, this, this, is, this is a really big deal. And I actually, Stephen, my brother, talked to Stephen. He's here. My mom, my dad. And my dad, my dad was amazing. He's like, he read, read through the letter or skimmed it because it was really long. Didn't um, but, know that uh, was going to happen. Like, he was like, she, he, he said to me, she's for real. Like, this, this is obviously God is doing, doing something to her. But the same kind of thing, if you, if you act on this, this is, this, is, this is the moment. And so the cool thing is it really wasn't that long. It was a few it was a few weeks between the letter and I don't maybe it was a little a month whatever we see each other and it was clear okay this is this is God has got I've grown you've grown we, we still obviously have a long way to go but if you ever want to know when you how do I know when the one is the one and you may have heard this before can I promise you even in the midst of all the pain we've been through when you know you know you cannot fake peace you cannot you, if you listen if you are forcing a relation, if you are having to apply energy to your relationship right now or in the future when you have one, that should tell you to pause and reflect. Because when you're in, truly in God's will, there's a ton of energy that goes into growing, but you're not having to make it work at any level. It just, you know it's right. And so we do have to move. We made a decision that day, okay, this is something, but, but let's be sure it's God. And we literally, for 40 days, fasted. Uh, didn't see each other again for 40 days intentionally, prayed and actually fasted and said, okay, at the end of 40 days, we're going to have one more conversation at least. And what did God, sh you know, what, I'll show my cards, you show your cards and that. And that was, and in 40 days we came back together and uh, within less than a year we were married. And we got back together. It was like completely two different people and it was ultimately the right timing. 
and got back to Mary, got got back together and ended up getting married. Okay, so quick, we got to touch. And now we have four kids, and we're having this time. I'm just like, it's like, where do we go story-wise? Let's just leave the story. I don't want to get into the. Yeah, we need to say, like, what we saw in each other real quick because it was really powerful. So what do you look for? Um, some of the things uh, for girls uh, that I saw in Mark, I he loved Jesus more than he loved me. And that's something easy to say, and this, but this is in when the day-to-day. Day. And I want to be clear, this is when we got back together. So this is the image we would love to leave you guys, because the first go-around, even though it was good, it wasn't great. And, that, and I, there was times where in the first go-around where I let Jill take that place above Jesus. Yeah, And absolutely. because of that, it affected how I could lead her in the relationship. So. And same. And, it, and even in marriage, we can still wind up there sometimes. And I can look to him for needs to fill me that it's not, if I put it on him, it's, um, it, he can never fill those things. I have to first get my fill from Jesus. He is everything I need. That's period. <laughs> now, I don't always get this right now, but in, the, in our first go around, and be aware of this, I wanted to fix her problems because I needed her to need me like that. And what I grew in was I got to now I got to push her to Jesus, even at the time she can. I want to be the hero, or even in the time she wants me to be the hero, I cannot take that place pushing her to Jesus. And I wasn't strong enough to do that the first time around. And that can be vice versa. The girls can want that need. Oh, he needs me. He needs me. He needs me. No, he needs Jesus. Um, you know, like, yes, he does. Yes. Need Jesus. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay, so then the second thing, and I love this. I, this is probably my number one attribute outside of loving Jesus is that Mark was a learner. And I'm not just talking about book study, like learning. He'll read a book faster than anybody I know. But um, he learned. I watched him. We dated for two and a half years, broke up. I watched him grow in the Holy Spirit, like be taught by the Holy Spirit over that year. And, and then we got back together. I saw him grow um, when his dad corrected him. I've seen him grow when Pastor Chris has corrected him. I have seen him grow. He is a learner in every environment that he is in. And girls, if you're looking for somebody that you can count on in the future, is a learner. If they're listening to the Holy Spirit, no matter what you find yourself in, you'll be okay. And the opposite of that, learner, maybe not even the right, it's hard to put a word on it, but if, they're, if you notice that they're a victim in those kind of moments, you need to be really aware of that, ladies. So if they respond to hardship through learning, that's a great thing. If they respond to hardship with defensiveness or victimhood, that's a very dangerous thing. Because that's just an area of God that God hasn't healed them of yet. Um, I, okay. And then I, uh, someone that can make you laugh. Because you know what? This journey, this life, sometimes it gets heavy. It's, it's hard. And we're not going to lie to you and say it's all easy and blissful after. It's hard. Some days are not so great. Even this morning. Like, I'm really nervous about today. And he's, like, trying to make me laugh. And it made me even more mad. But find somebody <laughs> that you can laugh with because if you don't enjoy the journey, what in the world are we doing? Yeah, I mean, we were prepping for this last night after First Wednesday. And so I ordered a Taco Bell at 11 o'clock last night. Like, we did it. We did it. Straight up DoorDash Taco Bell last night. Like we're 23 years old in college. And we're, we were talking. We're, we're 40. But we were talking about college, and I regretted that decision immediately after that. But we just have fun. Bottom line is have fun. And create, create energy around it. And, and you're, you're amazing at that, too. And so here's here for you guys what I saw. This is so great, guys. Write this down. Just find a, find a lady who's honoring God with their beauty. And I don't mean that to, to, to say that anyone who's not isn't worthy in any sense. That just means, again, they're, they need God to heal that area of their life. I heard a great quote years ago. Is beauty is found, is found in mystery. And if nothing is a mystery, then nothing is sacred. And so beauty and sacredness are, are connected, and God can restore any of that, ladies, for sure. I think for guys, what, if, if you're around a lady who hasn't kind of gotten there yet, be a great friend and encourage them to Jesus. But it's not timing yet. It's not there for a relationship. Uh, secondly. I want to say this really quick. Girls, you know what Mark fell in love with me? Uh, what I was always wearing when Mark fell in love with me? My soccer workout clothes. All the time, that's what I lived in. And I'm, I'm not trying to be, fun. like, I didn't have to try. Like, it was, it was something so much deeper than that, okay? Uh, allowing themselves to be pursued is huge. And I think just that's, that's um, 
just a, a sign of health, but also it's going to force you, man and ladies, you're going to love this, to be the man that God's called you to be. And I need you guys to do that. We'll talk more about that in a later chapel this semester, just as men of God. Here's another huge one is that, that ladies speak well of others when they're not around. And that's one thing that I love, love about Jill. Jill never, she's always speaking well of other people and building people up. And then that they've surrounded themselves with the right friends, um, I think is, a, is another huge one. So honoring God with their beauty, allowing themselves to be pursued, speak well of others, and then surround themselves uh, with the right friends. Here's some final things because we are out of time that, that uh, we'll definitely take another chapel. I think there's some more here that we can really dig into deeper. But here's just the lessons we've learned through marriage, through all of that we just shared with you. And a lot of these have come even from other relationships around us. And I think if you take this as just a good framework, and there's more to it than that we can give you in two minutes, as a great framework, then you will discover, that you will, God will lead you to, and you'll have the eyes to see the right person. And that ultimately, that marriage relationship that comes from that will be the kind of relationship that will propel your ministry. And these, these are just huge. Here's the first one. The best foundation, you probably have heard this, but it is true. Look me in the eyes. The best foundation is friendship. The fact that we were able to be close friends before we ever started dating has allowed our relationship, even on its hardest moments, to have something that was unshakable. When we were broken up, what I actually miss most, I miss the romantic intimacy, all the, all the, all the typical. What I actually missed was she was my best friend. I, it's like I lost my best friend. And that foundation has served us well. In the hardest moments of relationship, we have that foundation of friendship. And it's huge. And it's worth delaying anything else beyond that to actually have a wholesome friendship that's not established just on attraction, but is actually, we actually like each other. And we're here together no matter what. We're friends. And I would rather spend time with you than anyone else. So, It's true. And we have a lot of fun. Um, the second lesson that we learned is you can't force God's timing. So the first round of when we dated, it was good. People from the world standard would have looked, even from Christian friends, but was like, this is a good relationship. But don't settle for good. God has best. God's design is best. When we broke up and we allowed God to work in both of us over that year, then we got back together. It was best. And like Mark said, it was like the previous relationship was we were talking about friends who, who dated exes. Like that's how far removed we were from who we were. God had worked, a d did a deep work inside of us. So his timing is everything. And if you're dating right now, and I'm not, I'm not the guy that's going to like break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend right now, right? So like this is those. But if you are, need to, then do it. <laughs> she is that person. She's an eight on the ending. She's an, a seven wing eight. I'm a three. So we're very different approaches to the same place. So, um. But, but I want to be, if you're forcing God's timing, if you're applying energy, then you have to ask yourself the question, am I willing to live the next 50 years having to apply this much energy or more to make this work? And if it just, you, there's better than that. Um, unity, of, next, number three, unity of lifestyle and calling are everything. And that's a strong statement because it's true, is we are so blessed in every healthy relationship around us that we've seen has a measure of this, not always necessarily ministry, and there's different ways God does this, by the way. That's not, we're not the prototype of this. The value we, we hold, which is we have, and this happened honestly within even um, the year that we, or the time we got back together, it's just it was so clear that we were heading in the same direction, and we actually had honest conversations. We couldn't have had it in our first two, two and a half years, but in our, in our second go around, honest conversations about what we were dreaming about, what was in our heart, and I want to make sure you guys know that. Don't just stumble into that and hope it happens. You are worth, and your calling is worth, having those conversations. We had no idea it was going to be Highlands College or what it would look like, but we did know this, that the values and the passions and the calling were going to lead us in the same direction. We were never going to wake up one day, and I was here and she was here. We were going to lead together. We're on the stage together. We've always led together. We're in the same. We have different roles, and, but, but she is a leader, and I'm a leader, and we are leading together in the same direction. And I value her. I cannot do what I'm doing without her. She makes me better in every single way. And, and I, I pray that the same is true for, for, for um, her, for me. And I want that for all of you guys. And that's why Highlands College is a great fertile ground to find the right person. But it's not automatic just because you're both in ministry. It's even what kind of ministry and what does that look like for you guys. So. And I think we always settled on, you know, it, it, that sounds dreamy and it's like, oh, we're both going to be on the mission field in Africa. But, but you don't really know the exact plans that God has yeah, for you. It's not the what. It's not the what. What we always say and we tell our kids to this day is we will always say yes 
to whatever God is calling us to do. No matter how hard it is, no matter how unpaved the road looks, that we both were solidified, a conviction inside of us that we were always going to say yes to God. Um, so uh, I lost myself. Yep. Um, and I want to say one more thing. I know we got to get moving. But um, that's where submission comes in. And I want to clarify submission because sub means to come under a mission. Okay, so we're both submitted to God, right? We're, we're coming under God's mission. And then I'm submitted to him because we're com- I, I believe that God has placed on him the authority and the weight and the ability um, to carry being the uh, spiritual uh, leader in our home. Okay, so we're coming under and that only works when he's submitted to God himself. Okay, so. Um, if I abuse that, I've, I know we got to say, I got to preach this now. You just set me up. Sorry. I know. We've really got to go. Um, I, I'm not a rock climber, but if you imagine a rock wall, okay, and you've ever seen two climbers climb, they actually both need each other. They cannot get to the top without each other. And I want you to imagine that with your relationship. I am, as, a, as the male, and as God has laid it out in his, in his sovereignty, I have a role of spiritual leadership, which requires me to love Jesus and become the man God has made me to be. It's a great accountability from God to lay my life down for him, to protect and to cover her. That does not, what that requires, though, is for me to love God deeply and to love her and to see the call of God that's on her life. Well, guess what? She's also doing the same thing. She's submitting to God's plan, his sovereignty. She's coming underneath. And I, could, I would not be on the stage today without Jill. And, and where, where my job is, as God leads us and as our family, is that I keep, we keep in that unity and step. And so as I climb, she's climbing with me, and we're just going together, and we could never get there separate. And that's, that's the picture I want to leave you guys with, is it's, it's a team effort start to finish. It's the spiritual leadership. I always felt like a man was like, go out front, figure it all out, and report back. It's not that. It's, she's my other half. We're in this completely together, and we're leading together in the same direction. And that's why I think um, it's, that, that actually is what makes the adventure so much fun, is that you're on it together. So. Um, something else, a lesson that we learned is uh, regardless of how you grew up, the family that you come from, uh, surround yourself with healthy examples to learn from. God always put in our path, and it wasn't like one couple we learned everything from. It was like one couple we learned how to do this, and one couple we learned what not to do, and one couple we learned a whole different topic, you know, and but we always were willing to learn from anybody that was around us. You are not defined, if you grew up in a broken home at any level, you are not defined by that, and you are not handicapped for the rest of your life. I want you to break that off of you, the lie off of you, if it's divorce or abuse or broken, you are not defined by that, and thankful for this family and the family of God that will be there, I promise you, every every area the enemy's tried to, you know, take you out or he's tried to put a crack into the wall, God is there not just to fill it and it to be temporarily fixed, he is good there to heal it and for it to become a strength for you. And so I just want to make sure that no one is marked by that and that we break off every generational curse. I'm going to pray in a minute. We break off all of that, and there are healthy examples. Just mine the gold out of them, or you're missing a huge opportunity of the body of Christ. That's me? Yeah. All right, real quickly. I'm just going to finish this out. All right, so take, I think, I think this is, we've said these next two, and we can get the keys up and finish. Take personal responsibility for your own maturity. Okay, so I, I have to mature in Christ to this day, now we're 17 years almost in marriage, every day waking up and maturing in Christ, or at some point I become the lid on our marriage and on our ministry. I cannot control her doing the same. I can encourage her. I can, I can, I can see when she's struggling. I can, you know, go, but she has to also take personal mis- responsibility for her own maturity. If you do, I speak this over the married couples that are here and everyone is here, a testimony from this far into the journey, there is no lid, there is no ceiling. God will take you as far as you are wanting, if you, as you, beyond where you dream you could go, as far as you are willing to mature. That's how far God will take you. And so marriage and ministry become about individual maturity that then corporately come, becomes a couple's maturity and then a family's maturity. Our kids benefit from our maturity, and that's something that you pass down through your lineage. And so I think it's an incredible picture. And then we've already talked about it, and we'll just finish out with this. And I hope this is encouraging today. I hope you all have enjoyed today is it's going to be fun. It's not, that, but if it was perfect, it wouldn't be fun. It would be clinical. The fun is the fact that it's raw and real and at times ugly and broken and it's, it's uncertain and it's foggy and then it's clear and there's a mountain and there's another valley and it's beautiful. 
And I just want you to know, it's not the aspirational movie picture of beautiful. It's the God story beautiful that you read from Genesis to Revelation. And that is your destiny. You, you, that God has that plan for you. To, to find and marry, and, to, and if that is his call in your life, to find the person to marry them. And to have this adventure and this journey that are uniquely yours and are covered in God's grace and his peace. And will take you together where you could never get separate. That's what I always tell married couples at the altar. God was not satisfied with good. You were good, you were good, but together you're great. And that is God's, that is, that is the mystery of, of when you read Paul talking about the mystery of marriage, the mystery of the husband and wife. I don't understand it all. I just know God understands it all. And it's his plan. And so there's all the benefits that come with it, but the core of it is, it's, a, it's the most, in my opinion, in, up to this point in my life, and it's just the most amazing way to glorify God is through the submission and unity and, and, the, and the picture of, of marriage, you know, so echoes our relationship with God and the kingdom. And so... In, in marriage, um, it's not what you get out of marriage. It's not just for you. It's not really even about us. I think what Marcus, uh, he said before, um, and I love the way that you said it, is through marriage, God maximizes our impact for the kingdom on the world. We, we're doing more together than we could have ever done on our own. But it's all submitted to his mission, Right. Marriage is a part of a bigger story than just my needs or his needs. And that's a beautiful picture of what, you know, our story, we love it, but it's because we didn't write it. We were along the journey and we were willing to not be in control and to let God take the pen and write it. And there's encouragement and there's hope in that because God is so, his thoughts and his ways are higher than ours. And so we just want to pray over you guys. Because we know there's, there's people on all aspects of the journey, um, been hurt before, never been hurt, expectant, hopeful, um, still needing healing. We know that there's all stories in this room. And uh, we just want to take a moment and, and pray over you guys. Okay. I want to pray over the girls. So girls, if you would, just open your hands. Father, I thank you. For every girl that is in this room. God, I thank you that you see her. That you know everything that's going on in her heart and in her mind. Father, I thank you that you knit her together. That she is fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and not only that, but God, you say that you are enthralled by her beauty. And God, right now, I just come against the enemy. Whatever lies have been spoken over, your daughter's. God, I silence them. I pray that they would be exposed and then silenced and they would be replaced by your truth, that she is an overcomer, that there is nothing that can separate her from the love of God. God, I pray that, they, that she would begin to see herself the way that you see her. God, that you would lift up her head from whatever she's carried before and God, that you would crown her with joy and purity and boldness, and strength. And God, I just thank you for them. God, I pray that you, they would find their value in you. God, what your son did on the cross speaks more to their value than any person, any words, and any act could ever do. And God, I pray, Father, that they would receive your love fresh and anew today, the love that you are lavishing on them, and that would define them more than anything else in their life even the words that they say about themselves. Father, forgive us for the way that we talk about ourselves. God, I pray that you would convict us and that our words would line up with what you say about us. God, I pray for a fresh perspective of purity, a fresh conviction of purity. We are your daughters and we want what few have so we know it's going to take what few actually do. And God, we just want to more of you and less of us. God, we surrender, we submit ourselves to your will, your ways. And God, we cannot wait to see all that you do in every girl in this room and the story that you write through them and the marriages, the strong marriages that are gonna impact the world for your kingdom in Jesus' name. God, I pray for every, just every man in this room. Guys, I would love you to open your hands as well. I just pray and prophesy over this room 
just the spirit of the sons of God, that, that every man in this room would know that they are made in your image. Whatever other image of a father or, or a, a male authority in their life they've had, even the best falls short of you, God. So today in this room, all of us as men, as men look to you for our affirmation and our confidence that we have what it takes, not because we can create that with our own strength or our own ability. We have it because we have decided to put ourselves on the altar of Jesus Christ to be crucified. And so all of our weaknesses are now strengths. We proclaim that, God. I proclaim that over every one of these men, that they would hear the words that I know you're speaking over them, that they have what it takes, that they are your son, that you are well pleased with them. And God, I know that right now in their minds, they can rehearse everything they've ever clicked on or looked at or said or done or every line they've crossed. And maybe even with a person that's in this room and there's a, con a conviction that maybe even right now the enemy's trying to turn into a, a condemnation. I break that off in the name of Jesus and say today is the day where we tr are transformed in our minds and our hearts. That God, we see ourselves accurately as we are so that we can begin to live out the identity that you have for us. And God, we're not building to that. We're standing firmly right now in the identity that you've given us as your sons. And God, I pray for a strength over these men that will begin as a, a passion for your word like never before. That we will be transformed by the renewing of our mind that would come from the word of your, your uh, the, the word of the, uh, the word of God, the word of truth. That we would allow truth to impact us in every place where there's been any lie of the enemy or any sin or any addiction or any fallenness. God, we let your word speak to us today. And God, I just thank you right now that even in this in, in this prayer moment, you are healing. God, you are restoring. God, you are speaking truth over. All the condemnation is gone, and we stand right now full of your grace and your mercy. And God, I thank you that these are men in this room who will pursue you. And God, we will all fall short of perfect, per perfection. But to our last day, our dying breath, and even after we're gone, people will speak of these men and say they, will, they were men of God who pursued you with their life. God, they loved you with all of their heart. They loved and served their wives. They loved and served their children. They lived out the call of God on their life. No weapon formed against them could prosper. They were more than conquerors. God, just as your word says in Hebrews, they did not shrink back and they were not destroyed in a culture that was looking to pull them down. They stood above it. And God, they represented you on this earth. God, I speak that over every man. And God, believe in all of my heart that is their destiny. And God, we together today, and this is every, every team member, every person who's married in this room, speak over every person who's single in this room. That God has a great plan for you. All anxiety is gone. All fear is gone. All effort, human effort, ceases right now in the name of Jesus. And we trust the Holy Spirit more than we ever have before to give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a peace that transcends understanding. And God, we just decide today, come on, every single person in this room, that we're going to let peace be the marker. And until we have your supernatural peace that cannot be disguised or mistaken, then we refuse to take this matter, marriage, dating, into our own hands. God, I pray finally for any courage, for the, just a measure of courage that is needed. If there is a change in a relationship that needs to happen, a status that needs to happen today, that what you're speaking would be followed with the courage to live it out and to do what you have called us to do, which no matter what will always lead us, God, to the, the promised land, to the place of our destiny. We trust you with that in the unseen areas, with the journey in front of us like never before in this moment. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hey, God.